Can we talk about fasting? I know sure. this gets religious for many people and I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to disrespect anyone's fasting religion. I'm just, hopefully we can encourage people to be curious and, and consider these things. But I'd like to talk a little bit about your perspective on fasting, potential downsides of fasting. And then maybe we can segue into a quick conversation about autophagy, yep. because I think that autophagy gets thrown around so much. And when you and I had conversations offline, and the more I look into this, it's, it's much more complicated than it's made out to be in the general public. When I talk to people about autophagy, they say, oh, yeah, it's house cleaning. And everyone knows that it's good when I clean my house or, you know, like everyone knows that it's good to sweep the floor. Right. Yeah. And so when you when you don't eat, it's like your body is sweeping the floor. Right, Georgie. And I think like, no way. It's much more complicated. Much more complicated. Than that. Yeah. And Cancer can, also sweeps a lot. As, as somebody <laughs> studies showed you. <laughs> right. Exactly. So let's talk about this and and maybe maybe encourage people to be a little curious about the full the really what's what we really fully understand with autophagy and you know, and, and maybe you can speak to the fact, like, do you think that humans need to do a lot of fasting to get optimal autophagy? And is there something, I think there's more to the story. So the, uh, the benefits of fasting that I've seen for, for people to actually to benefit from the fasting are people who really had a very high endotoxin response, kind of mimicking what the older studies showed that most of the benefits to fasting come from the reduction of, of endotoxin. Unfortunately, not all people can handle fasting very well. I wouldn't put a fragile person who is, let's say like, uh, uh, and the way I define fragile is I would do a, a blood work analysis and see how, what the hormone levels are. If your cortisol to DHEA ratio is higher than 0 0.5, fasting is actually might actually do a lot more damage than, than good. Uh, because obviously when you're fasting, cortisol is going to rise even further. And whenever cortisol rises, that further suppresses the, the synthesis of, of DHEA. And it's the cortisol to DHEA ratio, which just like the um, uh, the muscle mass, which, by the way, affects the muscle mass because one of them is a catabolic, the other one is uh, anti-catabolic hormone. The cortisol to DHEA has, is now recognized as the best predictor of both uh, longevity and also morbidity. So if that, if that ratio is over 0 0.5, in other words, if it starts going in favor of cortisol, you're basically looking at initially cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, mm. uh, neurological disease. And if it goes you know, further higher, eventually you're looking at things like uh, cancer. Uh, in fact, uh, a recent study showed that no cancer patient had a cortisol to DHEA ratio that was below, I think, 1.5, so heavily in favor of cortisol. And we're, and we're primed to think, and I think especially doctors are primed to think of cortisol as an anti-inflammatory hormone. I know they give it to a lot of people with cancer in the hospital, right? Uh, but it looks like cancer cell, I'm sorry, the cortisol is contributing a lot to the growth of specific cancer cells, especially the ones that are difficult to treat. Triple negative breast cancer, recent study came out, showed that it's not, it may be triple negative, but it's certainly respons responsive to hormonal therapy. In other words, if you give it an anti-cortisol drug, the, basically the cancer disappears. Um, and then I think pancreatic cancer is also notorious for expressing a lot of glucocorticoid receptors. So high mm -hmm. cortisol can actually drive that. Maybe mm -hmm. what, what ended up doing in Steve Jobs, because he was chronic for, he, he's famous for his chronic and, and prolonged fasts and off, both often and very long. And he was also a fruitarian. Scary, scary story. When Ashton Kutcher was doing the biopic for Steve Jobs, he subjected himself to the diet that Steve Jobs did. He ended up in hospital twice with acute pancreatitis, which, uh, as you know, has a very high mortality rate. But also he freaked the doctor out because that's a precursor stage to, to pancreatic cancer. And uh, Kushner, Kushner's old doctor said, whatever you're doing, stop doing it now because I don't want you to end, to end up like Steve Jobs. Um, so so these chronic elevations of cortisol, which will happen with fasting, um, you know, uh, are not good for anybody, but a younger, healthier person is probably in a better position to weather them on and basically kind of benefit from the reduction of endotoxin. But if you are older, like especially if you have the, the sarcopenic obesity, I mean, raising cortisol is perhaps the worst thing you can do for such a person. Um, older people are notorious for basically getting frail very quickly if they skip even one meal. They don't eat very often, but when they need their meal, if you don't give it to them, they basically can very quickly decline. Um, a bit of a, you know, actually a very sad story. But if you remember this woman that was in a vegetarian state, Terry Shivo, I think she was called. Uh, she mm -hmm. was in a, she basically uh, fell on the bathtub, hit her head, and was in a coma in a vegetarian state for many years. Eventually, the, the husband wanted her dead. The parents wanted her alive. They fought through the courts. But eventually the court said, I got to let her expire. Well, how do you, I mean, what do you do? With a, you can't euthanize them. It's not legal in the United States. So what do you do? They just stopped her food. And, and she was so frail that within two days she was gone. 
So, mm-hmm. so it shows you that it, depending on the person, you know, fasting is, is, it may not produce the benefits that are desired. And many of those benefits, you can probably mim- mimic them by taking charcoal. You know, if that's really the, what, what, what uh, uh, you know, fasting is does, reduction of the endotoxin and the inflammation, take some charcoal, take some insoluble fiber. Uh, in fact, you can buy some insoluble fiber pretty cheaply on the Amazon and get, eat like a tablespoon a day. That's probably more than enough. Uh, and you don't have to torture yourself. Um, Invariably, I've seen that the people who benefit the most from fasting tend to be younger, leaner, and healthier. The people that are, you know, uh, you know, overweight or on the older side, basically over 50, so to speak, they don't handle fasting well. Um, they they may lose weight, but they come out of it. Uh, in fact, um, I, I, I I'm blanking on the name of the study, but a study showed that that uh, people over 50 who fasted chronically, after the end of the fast, they were at much higher risk of getting a potentially lethal infection. Probably due to the cortisol, immunosuppressant, right? So they, they fasted for a long time and then they thought they're healthier. Now they're skinnier, but the obesity paradox strikes again. It's, uh, you know, apparently for some people, it's better to have the extra weight because, you know, you know uh, you're not fasting and you're eating well to support the immune system than to fast because if, you, if your cortisol to DHA ratio is high enough and you raise it even further, um, I don't think anything good will come out of that. Don't you think also that a young person who wants to fast could achieve the same benefits by doing other things that lower LPS or endotoxin, not eating as many resistant starches that they're probably I, eating? I will start like with that. Said. Yeah. You know, yeah. If you get into the point of fasting means you've done so many other things wrong that now you basically get into like these desperate measures. You have to fast. Okay. I mean, maybe like a couple hour fast, skipping breakfast and lunch and then eating dinner every once in a while. I wouldn't do this every day. Not like the warrior that we're supposed to only eat in this like a right. very tight schedule, right? In between uh, what is it, midnight and six a.m. and then the rest of the day you don't eat. That's kind of that's basically the Ramadan fast. But yeah. these people do it for a month, and they know very well that actually that's that that you, you shouldn't be doing more for more than a month. And in fact, they, they have a special exemption in the religious text saying that if you're a pregnant woman, if you're a small child, or if you're an and or sick and old person. You should not be doing the fast, okay? They actually, they can, the, the whatever their, the priest is there, they can tell you, I'm ordering you to not do Ramadan fast because it's bad for you. Allah doesn't want you dead. Allah wants you alive and, and kicking and functional. Um, so even those people that, that practice the extended the religious fast, they're very well aware it, can, it does not work for everybody. And if you're one, if you're one of these people, you get a pass. You don't, you don't get to torture yourself. So benefits of fasting, primarily reduction of endotoxin, <clears throat> coming from undigested food in the colon. And, and serotonin. Food. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and you can achieve that, like you said, charcoal, reducing your insoluble, reducing your soluble fiber, excuse me, uh, reducing your resistant starches, eating more simple carbohydrates, which everyone is afraid of, honey, fruit, juice, fruit. Those would probably all achieve the same thing. Now, in terms of the cortisol to DHEA, DHEA ratio, um, is that like, would you do, just so people can do that, um, is that a, would you do like a morning fasted cortisol and a morning DHEA at the same time? How would you measure those to make that ratio? I'm thinking about my blood work yeah. and, and the units of those two also. Do they, do they have to be the I same? Think the same. I think they are the same. Yeah, they, they, okay. At least in the States, they're in the same. I think they're nano, uh, milligrams or nanograms or milligrams per deciliter. And I think it's uh-huh. the same, the same um, range for, uh, for cortisol and DHEA. We are producing similar amounts of cortisol and DHEA. These are the two hormones that basically once you reach puberty, uh, cortisol and DHEA are produced at, at a you know very high amount. And with aging, DHEA declines, but cortisol production does not. So the cortisol to DHEA ratio actually naturally, if, if you consider aging natural, naturally increases. So one uh, another explanation of why we become catabolic with age and we don't basically uh, you know respond that well to protein. Um, I'm pretty sure the, the the ranges are the same. Some countries measure them in nanomoles per liter. That's also mm-hmm. okay. Um, but basically, the you know the, the I can send you a few studies. Uh, I, you know, I think they measure they use they use the U.S. and the Western Europe uh, metric, which was in the nanograms per deciliter, and they divided cortisol to DHA or cortisol to DHA sulfate is another good measure, probably better because the DHA sulfate is a more of a longer term indicator of how much DHA you're producing, uh, and I think that ratio was 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 about the same. Basically, it should not be more than zero point five. Um, we're uh, the test that we're doing with my group in Bulgaria with the nail and hair shows this very well because it's a long-term measurement. But if you're doing blood tests, I will do maybe like uh, 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 every two weeks for maybe like a, a month or two and then average the results out uh, and see how they are. Because like, like you said, if you're fasted, cortisol is going to be higher than optimal, right? Uh, maybe the best thing is to do in the afternoon because that's when you're supposed to be at your healthiest. Cortisol is supposed to be lowest. DHA is supposed to be highest. And if at that point your ratio is not optimal, then, then you're probably in trouble.
Yeah, so looking at the cortisol to DHA ratio, as I'm thinking about it now, it might make more sense to do that one as a non-fasted yeah. lab. Yep. And I, when I was back in the States um, in March this year, I did, I did blood work because I like to do it as often as possible. And I was, uh, I'm always doing fasting blood work. It's just the norm. And I'm thinking, man, <laughs> I, I usually eat now first thing when I wake up. And I don't like not eating yeah. um, because I just it don't, I don't feel as good. And it's something we've talked about on previous podcasts. I, I think that... Um, yeah, getting more glycogen back. I want to keep the cortisol down. So I just think, wow, I'm, I'm always doing these fasted blood work because I want to get lipids and that's the standard is fasting lipids. But I think in the future, I might do more blood work non-fasting and just maybe even do lipids non-fasting and understand that the triglycerides will not be fasting, but everything else will look a little differently. Testosterone obviously has this diurnal pattern. It's highest in the morning. People are used to looking at testosterone that's like a 7.30 or an 8 a.m. testosterone. So interesting stuff though, but maybe the cortisol for DHEA ratio, people, I mean, that's an interesting predictor of overall stress. Overall, I think more people should more do that. Morbidity and mortality. And for males, a similar test, which male specific was cortisol to testosterone ratio. It should be less than 10. Um, yes. And uh, several studies show that people with PTSD, specifically males, have a cortisol to testosterone ratio that's 30 or higher. And in fact, some of these people, when they're given testosterone therapy for unrelated reasons, their PTSD resolved. So it shows that PTSD is really is like a chronic stress that cannot be remediated until the, the endocrine framework is rebalanced back to normal. Um, yeah. it's, so, so some studies are actually now testing DHEA supplementation for PTSD. Unfortunately, in males, and less so in females, if you take a very high dose of DHEA, a lot of it will convert to estrogen. Uh, not so much with testosterone, because even though testosterone is a precursor to estrogen, in fact, a direct one, testosterone itself is a moderately strong aromatase inhibitor. So it will kind of inhibit its own conversion to estrogen. You may still raise it, but DHA is much better in that, and it's not, not an, it's not an effect we want. But still, it shows you that the anti-catabolic hormones for males and for females have this, this plethora of beneficial effects, both metabolically and mentally and as a longevity, as in general frailness and, and everything else. Let's talk about autophagy real quickly. This is an eye-opening one for me. You know, Do you need to fast to get autophagy, Georgie? I don't think so. And some of the studies that I showed demonstrated that, in fact, sucrose, trechalose, fructose, and I think maltose, several sugars, when they were administered to the animals, the levels of, of autophagy rose. Uh, so it's not something, yes, sure, when you're when you are basically fasting, the body has to get the calories from somewhere. And what is it going to do? Probably a, a, a good adaptive response is to consume the sick cells, right? The ones that are sending signals that are, you know, I don't know, they're, they're hypometabolic or they're about to turn cancerous and whatnot. So I think that's a good effect, but for how long? I don't, I don't think any study has, uh, has looked at basically at what point does fasting induced autophagy become, become detrimental. All they've seen is that, yes, sure, in the first six hours of fasting, uh, uh, the autophagy rates are greatly increased. But what happens afterwards? What happens if you, if you actually fast continuously? I don't know of a study that looked even at uh, uh, every day for six hours continuous fasting effect on autophagy. My guess is that at some point, the body will downregulate that response simply to preserve tissue, right, um, and keep your life longer. So like anything else, uh, I think every, every intervention that we try to trick the body into uh, or with uh, has a diminishing return on investment. And I think the same, the same is true uh, you know, with fasting.